Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Todd Miller of the Temple Sinai Brotherhood, and I want to thank all of you for being here uh, in person and also welcome those of you watching on Zoom. Uh, we're honored to have our uh, Senior you. Rabbi Emeritus, Jamie Gibson, with us this morning to speak on the topic of uh, extremism in the Jewish community left and right. Can the center hold? And uh, without further ado, I will, will introduce Rabbi Gibson. But before we uh, go, uh, let me uh, say to you folks on Zoom, if you have questions, please text them to me at 412-848-1082. Again, that's 412-848-1082. Thank you very much, and uh, it's my honor to uh, present Rabbi Gibson. Good morning, everyone. Or we say Boker Tov. How many thousands of times have I said that to you over the years? It is an honor to be invited back. Thank you, Todd. Thank you to the Brotherhood. It's wonderful to stand in this place and see your faces the way I saw them for so many times and so many, uh, so many times over the years and to know that the connection still exists, that the connection, the bond is still strong. I'm especially gratified that many of you are forming strong bonds with Rabbi Fellman, who in such a short time has made such a deep impression, and I'm hopeful that that will continue through this year and years to come. I give this talk today in memory of Larry Gibson, my father, who worked tirelessly in Minnesota to further the Jewish civic commitment to making his state one that lived up to the Jewish values he held dear and believed in with all of his heart. They named the Minnesota Jewish Joint Religious Legislative Coalition Annual Award for him to honor his lifelong supportive involvement in the most important issues of the day based on attachment to his religious, not secular, values. Five years ago today, he was struck down by a car while walking in downtown Minneapolis with the green light in the crosswalk with the walk sign on. It lasted only a day more, and he died on the Oct October 18th, which happens to be Avi and David's birthday. Rather than being too sad about this, both of them, my sons, see it as an honor to be linked with him in this way despite their grandfather's sudden and tragic death. May his name, his life, his love, and his legacy live on through his family and all who were touched by the best of this mensch, my father, this marvelous Jewish man. We're talking today about extremism in the Jewish community. There are so many other communities in which extremism is a problem, if not a crisis. Just this week, there were extremist murders in Western Europe and Afghanistan. This week, Allegiance was pledged to an American flag that was a rallying pole for an extremist attack on our most cherished national institutions of democracy. There has been violence between Israelis and Palestinians toward each other and the continuation of a brutal crime wave in Arab towns in Israel proper. And of course, this week, this coming week, we commemorate the horrific attack on all of us by a racist anti-Semite who that day declared his intent to kill as many Jews as he possibly could. But these are not our subjects today. This morning we're talking about the violence we do to each other within the Jewish community here and in Israel. And while most of this violence is done with words, there is such anger. Can I ask you to turn down the volume because it's feedbacking? Okay. Simmering under the surface that I fear real violence may appear sooner rather than later. As a rabbi, I frame my remarks with sacred text. So in this week's Parsha to come, Vayera, when Abraham is asked to sacrifice his son, at the very last moment, he is told, Al tishlach yadcha el na'ar, do not thrust your hand against the boy and do not make a mark on him. Abraham, commanded to sacrifice his son, is told by heaven to stop. The message in the end is clear. Do not commit violence against your own. We should not commit verbal violence against anyone, of course, but the lesson begins at home. And from Isaiah, words that were actually made famous by President Lyndon Baines Johnson. It's from Isaiah chapter 118. Come, let us reason together. Let us reach an understanding. 
Reaching and understanding means listening. Listening and more listening. It means sorting out true from false, fact from fiction, substance from bluster, compassion from cruelty, and empathy from apathy. I'll be making, I'll be talking about four areas of conflict with some subtopics for each and then talking about how I see us remedying this not at an organized political level but at a person to person level. The slide into partisan rhetoric including the demonization of those who disagree with us has been rampant in our country and in the Jewish community. This includes, but doesn't include all, mocking, name calling, questioning of intelligence, ascription of stupidity or evil intent. Jews calling each other Nazi represents a new low for Jewish discourse, both in Israel and here at home. This is the price, precisely the kind of rhetoric that got Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin killed more than 25 years ago. His opponents paraded in Jerusalem an effigy of him dressed up in an SS uniform. Seeing him as a Nazi who threatened the Jewish people made it easier for Yigal Amir to gun him down in cold blood. Jews are calling each other names on campus. Those who attempt to moderate speech against Israel or the Jewish community are called fascists, colonialists, or you guessed it, Nazis, by those who believe their truth triumphs over all others. Those who stand up for their right to support Zionism and other Jews are attacked as cultural imperialists, and you guessed it again, Nazis, or they are simply canceled. Jews are attacking each other right here politically in America. People are shocked when I tell them that last year I surmised that as to in 2016, about 15% of Temple Sinai members voted for President Trump. That did not make me hate them, dislike them. It made me curious about them. Well, we're such a liberal congregation, people said. Well, no, people come from all over. We have members of this congregation who live in Suwickley, in Ligonier, and halfway down to Uniontown. People came from different points of view, not just on the map, but on the political spectrum. And those who supported former President Trump because of his stance on Israel have bitterly attacked other American Jews who they perceived as being ungrateful or simply wrong about him. They see the left wing of the Jewish community as hopelessly naive and allied with forces on the progressive left who distrust us or actively dislike us as Jews. They see Jews on the left as being unwilling to adapt to the times in which we live. And I know of one Orthodox congregation in this zip code, not far from here, where service goers expect some of them to be packing heat on Shabbat, and they do. Those on the left here in Pittsburgh were enraged that the former president would visit here in the wake of the Tree of Life, Orla Simcha, Dor Chadash, and New Light Shooting, tragedy that we commemorate this week. They perceived him as fostering precisely the kind of hatred and bigotry that fomented the attack in the first place. Jews are attacking each other in the West Bank. Or should I say right-wing settlers are attacking Jews who show up to support and protect Palestinians, especially during this month's olive harvest, as happened this very week. Last month, there was a brutal incident in the South Hebron Hills during which activist Jews including an old youth group friend of mine, Susie Gelman, tried to escort a water buffalo tank to a Palestinian village and were stoned by Jews for doing so. The organization Combatants for Peace, their activists were injured by fellow Jews who showed no compunction or remorse for doing so. Which leads us to our second point. And even as we talk about discourse and words, Israel has become the flashpoint between North American Jews. Liberal Jews who support a two-state solution for Israel and the Palestinians, like me, are caught in the middle. If we express our, Jews, our views openly, we can and are canceled by left and right alike. 
We're canceled by the left for not denouncing Zionism as imperialism and colonialism. We're denounced for not supporting the BDS, Boycott, Sanction, and Divestment Movement. We're canceled by the right for being squishy in our support of Israel and dealing with implacable enemies like Hezbollah, Hamas, and Iran, all of whom have stated their desire to kill Jews, not just Israelis. Being canceled or threatened by either side is the antithesis of Jewish teaching on how we handle disagreements in our faith. The challenge of how North American Jewry should respond to the, the, the situation that Israel faces and its policies reached a furious climax this past May during the Gaza War. Many of you do not know that there was a public letter signed by more than 90 rabbinical and cantorial students at leading non-Orthodox seminaries which questioned the moral stance of the American Jewish community vis-a-vis -vis Israel. I'm going to quote from it, and I try not to quote extensively because it's hard to take in too much of a quote, but I, it deserves as much context as I can give it so I do not commit the errors I can accuse others of doing. They wrote, this year American Jews have been part of a racial reckoning in our community. Our institutions have been reflecting and asking how are we complicit with racial violence. Jewish communities, large and small, have had teach-ins and workshops, held vigils and commissioned studies. And yet so many of those same institutions are silent when abuse of power and racist violence erupts in Israel and Palestine. So many of us ignore the day-to-day -day indignity that the Israeli military and police forces enact on Palestinians and sit idly by as Israel upholds two separate legal systems for the same region. And in the same breath, we are shocked by escalations of violence as though these things are not part of the same dehumanizing status quo. And they wrote in bold letters, what will it take for us to see that our, our Israel has the military and controls the borders? How many Palestinians must lose their homes, their schools, their lives for us to understand that today in 2021, Israel's choices come from a place of power and that Israel's actions constitute an intentional removal of Palestinians? It's a highly charged statement written by the next generation of Jewish leaders, rabbinical and cantorial students from institutions including my own Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion. The only response that came from one of those institutions was from Rabbi Bradley Shavit Artson, who heads the Ziegler Rabbinic School, a conservative institution in LA. And he wrote the following, which I found very moving and poignant. He wrote, as your teacher, as your dean, and as a rabbi, I feel compelled to address what feels to me like an imbalance and a lack in the letter that moves it beyond the normal circle of diverse opinion. The letter spoke from the heart about the suffering of the Palestinian people, both from the recent conflict and from life under occupation. He wrote, I share this concern and admire centering the humanity and suffering of Palestinians too often ignored. But the letter was shockingly silent about the suffering of the Israelis and the relentless terror they face daily. The letter speaks poignantly of the large toll on Palestinian lives and property, but says nothing about the toll, psychic, physical, and social, on Israelis. They, too, are humans. Indeed, they are our family and our people. Their suffering is too often marginalized or justified as it was in this letter. There wasn't a word about the murderous tyranny of Hamas, which holds the Palestinian people in hostage and terror. These terrorists have diverted millions to build elaborate electronic tunnels whose only purpose is to kidnap and murder Israeli civilians, which diverts millions to build and launch deadly missiles aimed randomly at Israeli civilian centers, and which hides its military and terror operations been behind civilian residences and businesses. He writes, there was no word about the decades-long ways that Arab dictatorships have imposed the continuation of the occupation by denying his Palestinian citizenship, by maintaining an implacable vendetta against even the possibility of Israel's survival. There wasn't a word about Ahavat Yisrael, what we call the love of Israel, a love and solidarity with our fellow Jews, with the right of the Jewish people to self-determination in our own homeland. To the very real sacrifice, this experiment in Jewish national self-expression has imposed since its inception. There wasn't a word about the ever-present anti-Semitism that is patently visible in social media, in beatings and murders of Jews around the world, in slogans chanted at rallies claiming to be pro-Palestinian, in public calls to kill Jews. 
in bold print. I know the claims of being pro-Israel have been weaponized by those who advocate a particular version of Zionism and nationalism. I decry the partisan smothering of the diversity of ways to love and support Israel. That reality makes this response even more complex. But he writes, I insist on owning the possibility, no, the necessity of an authentically liberal Zionism, one that sees a democratic Israel side by side with a free Palestinian people, each committed to peaceful coexistence. There is no other way. The argument in the press is between Jews, not just the conflict between Israelis and Palestinians. Point three, social media is an intensifier of emotion, a purveyor of half-truths, a catalyst for instant negative responses, an affirmer of prejudices and the same speak, an inviter of TMI, which when I was in rabbinical school was Three Mile Island, <laughs> but we all now know means, what does it mean, Jack? Too much information. Too much information right? An encourager of instantaneous response over thought out words. Some say that this forum of social media is now where the real debate takes place in our day and age. And I say it's where provocation takes place every moment of every day, whether in words or pictures. I once made the error of offering a talk back to a provocative article from an Israeli newspaper. And when I told my eldest son, he scolded me. He instructed me to take it down and never ever to comment again online. He said, are you looking to make yourself a target, Dad? They will hound you online. They will track down your address and phone. They will find other members of our family, like me. Don't do it. This was affirmed by my other two sons. Every issue that's highlighted in social media is presented in essential and existential terms. Essential in, in that only some of the details are given, usually the most inflammatory, without sufficient context. Existential, as if this issue by itself will determine whether or not the Jewish people will live or go extinct. I learned a long time ago that our people is expert at doomsaying. As one of my favorite teachers, the premier American Jewish historian of our day, Jonathan Sarna, put it, the Jewish people is a people that never fails to see the dark at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> Point four. There's an increasing chasm between Orthodox and non-Orthodox Jews in worldview, discourse, terminology and focus. And make no mistake, the orthodox world is growing. The non-orthodox world is shrinking. The increase in world Jewish population to over 14 million, still four million shy of where we were September 1st, 1939, by the way, mm. is almost completely attributable to the orthodox and ultra-orthodox communities. We accuse each other Orthodox and non-Orthodox of being an existential threat to our people. Orthodox accuse conservative, reform, reconstructionist, and renewal Jews of leading our people to a spiritual holocaust by ignoring assimilation and intermarriage, diminishing the number of Jews in the world. They also accuse the non-Orthodox community, us, of ignoring their needs unless it's convenient, of making light of violent attacks on Haredi Jews because we don't relate to them, of making impossible demands on them for acceptance of our interpretations of Judaism, which they see as a chilul Hashem, a desecration of God's name, and a threat to what they think constitutes authentic Judaism. Non-Orthodox Jews accuse their Orthodox brothers and sisters of vilifying them and attacking their Jewish practice in private and in public. The liberal wings of Judaism are portrayed by the Orthodox as fake, imitation, artificial, and downright dangerous to the whole of the Jewish people. This was best exemplified in a political ad in Israel during the spring Knesset campaign this year. Quote from JTA, Jewish Telegraphic Agency. Anybody remember what a telegraph is? <laughs> Israel's two largest Orthodox political parties both released ads this week attacking Jews. One video, featured pictures of dogs in Kipot and Talit. 
with sunglasses. I don't know if you can see it. I know in Zoom you can't see it very well. I'll try to hold it up. You can find it online fairly easily. And the quote read, this is a Jew, and this is also a Jew, and this one, obviously his grandmother was a rabbi. Another ad featured a picture of an African asylum seeker in Israel with a caption, Jews certified by the Supreme Court, danger. Thousands of infiltrators and foreign workers will become Jewish through reform conversion. Now, liberal Jews of all stripes accuse orthodoxy, especially ultra-orthodox Jews, of threatening public health by not getting vaccinated for COVID and ignoring regulations about gathering in numbers. Some liberal Jews have called for police to intervene in Jewish gatherings in the name of COVID prevention, which touches the rawest nerve of some Jews, telling on other Jews to authorities, something that happened in our history. Some of our ranks also accuse orthodoxy of causing anti-Semitism by flouting these rules, which threaten to unleash the forces of hatred against us, not just them. And so the eternal question, what must we do? I'll offer three thoughts, and then we'll open for questions. The first is listen, listen, and then do more listening. Find other Jews to listen to who believe differently than you do. As I said before, reaching an understanding means active listening it means sorting out true from false, fact from fiction, as I said, substance from bluster, compassion from cruelty, and empathy from apathy. Don't just listen to those who belong to a different stream than you. Find those who belong to a different political party. Go to lunch, dinner, coffee, or a long walk in the park. Ask questions and don't interrupt, don't judge. Listen to what is said under their emotion Ask for their values and their principles. Refuse to get baited. Two, force ourselves. We must force ourselves to imagine the concerns of those who think and believe differently from us. Years ago, with the Jewish Unity Project, I developed a close friendship with Rabbi Yisro Miller, who for 25 years was the rabbi of Polyzetic. We were Talmud partners. And as leaders of the Jewish Unity Project, we had a debate project, a formal debate with a resolution with each side presented and then formal rebuttals. The resolution, should there be separation of religion and state in Israel? He argued for separation. I argued against separation and people's jaws dropped. Only after both presentations and some questions from the audience did we let them know that I wrote every one of Rabbi Miller's words. He wrote all of mine. We had to write based on what the other believed and what we understood them to believe, not what we did. The same Rabbi Miller and I were asked, along with then Rabbi Neil Shiland of Bethel in the South Hills, to go to Israel to our partnership area in Carmiel. And the week before we were studying Talmud, and Rabbi Miller closed his volume carefully and said to me, Rabbi Gibson, Jamie, I have terrible news to tell you. I said, what is it? Is something wrong with your family? He said, no, if we are in Israel and there is an occasion where we pray together, I can't count you in a minion. <laughs> and I said, well, I don't think you're questioning my mother's Jewish status. You must think that I know enough Jewish history, law, and text to be an actual heretic. Thank you, Rabbi Miller. Because had I not known things, I would be considered a babe stolen by, birth, by pirates at birth and would not be responsible and easily counted in a minion. And he laughed. He said, yes, you're a true heretic. And then we went back to studying Talmud. And then I said to him, you understand that I don't grant you one whit of authority to validate or invalidate. And he said, of course. And we went back to studying Talmud. He apparently felt bad because the next day he said, you know, Debbie and I would love to have you and Barbara over for dessert. And I said to him, Rabbi Miller, that's a wonderful invitation. We could not dream of accepting without knowing in advance that you would accept our invitation to come to our house and eat off our dishes, which he did. He did not eat in his own congregants' houses. 
but he ate in my house. And I made sure that everything was proper for him to do so. No giving up on our principles. Just because I understand why he doesn't accept mine doesn't mean I have to give them up. If you want to go know different Jews and what they think and believe, go to their synagogues and sit with them. You'd be surprised at the friendliness displayed and the hospitality offered. Don't expect Orthodox Jews to come here to Temple Sinai, though. Some will, most won't. So don't set yourself up for, by, for failure by expecting that a religious exchange will be on equal terms. Three, although I can't sit down with a West Bank settler, somebody who's angry and fearful at the same time, I, who support J Street and APAC, I can talk to people from If Not Now, which is to the left of J Street, and ZOA, Zionist Organization of America, which is to the right of APAC, to find out where they're coming from. I can ask why they fear what they fear, why do they believe what they believe, and I can ask for sources and engage on the basis of fact. I can respect their fears and not give in to them. I won't give in to them. I can ask for their principles and state why I disagree. Four, I'm a radical moderate. I'm absolutely intolerant of intolerance. I despise ignorance and the raising of voices or rhetoric to mask it. Light, light, Light is what we seek. Even when we disagree, it is incumbent on us to know that those with whom we speak are gifts of God and treasured by some, if not by me. I am humble enough to be willing to listen and admit someone else's view might be right without ever abandoning my own principles and values. And as I quoted from Torah and the prophets, the third section of the Hebrew scriptures is called the writings I want to end by quoting from Proverbs. He who seeks love overlooks faults. He who harps on a matter alienates a friend. But more poignant than that is in the next chapter, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Those who love it will eat its fruit. I hope and pray that we eat the fruit of good tongues in good speech in this challenging difficult, even bitter time. It is the best hope I know for a future of understanding, acceptance, inclusion, caring, and maybe even peace. If not now, when? When? If not our words, whose? If not us, who will fulfill the sacred task of bringing our people together for all of our sake, and for the sake of the world we love. Thank you. You want to come up? The microphone's here. Todd is going to be moderator. The mic is hot. It's on. Jerry? From your lips to God's ear. That's what we so, say. I can see the dark at the end of the tunnel, and I am going to attribute so many of these lines to you. I mean, <laughs> you're a genius. Um, it's not light, light, light. It's heat, heat, heat. I mean, I, I wear this mask, mm -hmm. and football fans, maybe not all of you, but some of you look like I either have Bin Laden or Hitler on this. I mean, it, it's incredible. I'm so depressed. So my friend Joe Palka, who many of you will know as the science correspondent on NPR, he said, Jerry, give up. Why, why are you trying to talk to people who don't already uh, uh, b believe in what you're saying? Y you can't change their opinion. And there was a recent study from the National Academy of Sciences that asked people across the spectrum, who do you, um, who do you respect? Right. And um, there were many people who respected the Pope. Then they said, um, the Pope is worried about climate change. And they changed their opinion. They no longer respected the Pope. Right. By the way, oh, 
Is there a question? <laughs> um, I guess there's medicines for depression. I don't know. But um, see, I've found that heat in discourse does not change minds, and that light continuously shine, shining has a chance over time, not in one encounter. The encounters I described with Rabbi Miller took three years to establish the kind of trust that we could joke about the most serious things to the point where at my 30th anniversary commemoration here, he wrote a public statement that was read in this sanctuary, highlighting our friendship despite our legitimate, authentic, real differences about world weighty matters in Judaism. It takes time. And as Louise Malakoff, one of my favorite, pre they're all my favorite presidents, Bob, you know that. <laughs> when we were trying to reconstitute the sisterhood, she said, we came up with a statement that I attribute to her, just because you stir it faster doesn't make it soup. You can stir all you want. Things soup when they soup. And I would only encourage people to not give up on the possibility of relationship until the other person forestalls it and says this will not happen. It, there's so much in what you said. And I think the idea of hearing, of what we say is listening, but just, just hearing mm -hmm. and agreeing not to respond, just hearing, it, it will take us miles. I God agree. bless you. Okay. That's Jeanette in the back. I um, read a piece this morning that said in the New York Times that you might be surprised at um, who is not mm -hmm. vaccinated. And I don't know if anybody else saw that. But what I found interesting relates to your first point about listening and the assumptions that we oftentimes make. Um, they said, you know, the most highly vaccinated group in America are people over 65 and it's running about 95%. And they said this is the same group that's likely to be Republican and is likely to be um, listened to Fox News a lot. And so uh, it just makes one stop and think about, we make assumptions about who is um, not getting vaccinated. Um, but I just thought that was a very interesting thing that we have to be careful about jumping to conclusions. And um, the other thing that they pointed out was that the group that, um, the real reason why there's a lot of vaccine resistors, uh, this is from, a, I think, a Kaiser Family Foundation uh, survey, was really the lack of insurance, health insurance, and having a provider that you trust. So it does make sense. It may not be just ignorance and other but he, things. But even though the shots are free. Mm -hmm. Right that now, was, yeah. what I learned from my dad, which is a quote ascribed to Mark Twain, I haven't found it there yet. My father taught me from the time I was seven years old, all generalizations are faulty, including this one, mm -hmm. which is kind of a Merbius strip of uh, mm -hmm. So every time I generalize, I say, what is my problem that in order for my world to make sense, I have to make this assumption or generalization? Okay. By the way, I'm gonna comment at the intermission here that what a marvelous synagogue that in the middle of a pandemic, people are finishing writing a Torah upstairs, people are studying Israel at the Hartman Seminar, and people are here right now, and the kids are studying in school. I just, I love the fact that there's this vitality and energy even in the midst of the pandemic. Yes, who's next? Bob. Yes, I have a question uh, with regard to the very complicated situation in Israel, and I understand that it's, it's extremely complicated, as you pointed out. What I'm having trouble with, and I guess this is my question to you, most people feel comfortable with the thought of a two-state solution for the Palestinians and the Israelis. And J Street promotes this dramatically, and I understand that. What I don't understand is in Palestine, the PLO is head of it, and they would be the people that we would negotiate with. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the Palestinians don't really listen to the PLO. Abbas is, 
I probably 15 or 20 percent of the people there. He's, he's in the 16th year of a four year term. <laughs> All right. What <laughs> happens is to get the two state solution, you have to negotiate with somebody. If you negotiate with the boss, Palestinians aren't on board. Well, that leaves you that leaves you to, to, to move to Hamas. How can you negotiate with a terrorist organization and Although it would be ideal to have a two-state solution, can you comment on how this is even possible? Okay, what we know from um, Ibrahim Shikaki, I think Ibrahim is his first name, he is the primary pollster in Ramallah for the Palestinian people, that if an election were held tomorrow, Hamas would win in a walk. And it wouldn't be because the Palestinian Authority was hated per se, it's because they're seen as older, Gener an older generation that is fundamentally corrupt. It is said, I don't have the proof of this, that Arafat's widow, Suha, is living in Paris off $50 million that he skimmed off the top of aid that was given there, and that he is not the, his, is, that's not the only story about people taking international aid and lining their own pockets as, instead of improving the lot of their people. If Hamas were to win an election and be in charge, there could be shoulder-fired missiles at Ben Gurion Airport from less than a kilometer away. I've been there. I have been in Israel 33 times. Since before the Camp David Agreement that President Carter brokered between Sadat and Begin. So I do not accept the notion that there is no partner for peace. I reject the notion that that peace is going to be made from the top down. So what is going on on the ground is that there are small groups of Palestinians and Israeli Jews who are meeting together quietly to try to form what I would call a civic consensus, what we might political scientists call soft power that radiates upward for creative solutions, whether it is cantonization like they have in Switzerland or some other way of doing it. it I think to say there is no way forward is to lock ourselves into a trap I think to expect a solution in, listen, after the Camp David Accord was signed in 1979 with me watching on a black and white TV from Jerusalem, I said, there's going to be peace. And after the Oslo Agreement was signed in the White House lawn, I said, there's going to be peace. There's not going to be peace in my grandchildren's time. <laughs> going on since 1885 when Jews began to awaken to the call to come back. One of the challenges is that both narratives are narratives that essentially exclude the other in terms of its reckoning. Even those who believe in a two-state solution don't necessarily take the Palestinian narrative as an authentic narrative that can stand up to with the same weight and value as the Jewish narrative. It is possible. It is not likely today, tomorrow, or next year. And that is why every president over the last 25 years who has built an apparatus a, a diplomatic apparatus through the State Department to solve the problem dashed on the shoals of the conflict. And when people say, well, they, anytime somebody says to you, well, if they just did this, give them a big smile. Just give them <laughs> a big smile. Only, you know, were that it, would that it were possible. And you can say, boy, it's so complex. I'm, I'm surprised you understand it so well, you know, if you want to be a little snarky. If you don't want to be snarky, you say, you know, it's, it's kind of beyond my pay grade, but what I can do is I can affect one person. And our job, and this is from my friend Tal Becker. Tal Becker from the Hartman Institute was one of the, has been one of the primary negotiators for the Israeli government since Oslo, which is a failure, by the way. And he said, your job as a North American Jew is not to solve the conflict. It's to have a better conversation here a more informed conversation, a conversation that invites comment and response and evokes caring. I do not mind people criticizing Israel. I do mind when they don't care about Israel. And one of the things that's happening in Zionist education and Jewish education now is this question of can we teach young people to love Israel and then criticize it out of love instead of just looking at it the same way they would look at human rights abuses in any other part of the world. Because if you're going to look at it in terms of other places of the world, I'm going to say, well, there's 600,000 dead in Syria right now. I'm going to talk about what the 
uh, the Rohingya and the Uyghurs and all these other situations which are far beyond what's happened between Israelis and Palestinians. We start small, we have a better conversation here. That's the whole point of the Hartman seminar. Anybody interested, they meet every Sunday to have a better conversation. Thank you, Bob. Jerry, you have the final slide. No, 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 you don't get it back to him. The, wait, wait, no, no. The people who have to go first these before you get seconds. <laughs> Jerry, you're wonderfully eloquent, so I'd be happy to send this over next. I have a question about collaboration in Israel. And in your time, and it, as you've just described, um, from the, the paradigm of working from the bottom up and working one to one, and your experience of going to Israel over time, over the years, mm -hmm. there have been many organizations and groups that have tried to work together. Have you seen, what well, if you would be able to help us understand what is going on in a collaborative way? And two, have you seen a difference in that kind of collaboration that might give us hope? The, the hope is seen underneath the thunderstorm. So everybody watches the lightning and hears the thunder, and it's all up here. And down here, there is a man who 10 years ago, named Ali Abu Awad, who was imprisoned during the Second Intifada. He decided to go a different route, and much of my inspiration comes from him. He lives in the area of Gush Etzion, which is one of the most hotly contested areas of the West Bank, where Jews have lived for centuries. After 1967, one of the settlement goals was to bring Jews back to where they had lived before they were thrown out in the 48 war. Okay. And Ali Abu Awad said that when he went to prison, he realized there were two university tracks in prison. One was how to be a better terrorist, and one was the philosophy track. And he took the philosophy track. And he said there has to be a different way. And less than five miles from where he lived, there was a settler rabbi from America who made Aliyah named Kanan Schlesinger. And he sought him out and said, let's have a human conversation, you and me. Let's start the conversation not based on political policies or even on parties or history or fighting about the facts. Let's start with one assumption. We both love the land. And they agreed. They both love the land. And they started a group which in Hebrew is called Shorashim, Roots. And those roots dig deep into the land. And they have started, little by little, to create an organization. And I, in my last couple trips to Israel, I bring people to Shorashim. And Ali Abu Awad is a big international figure now. We can't get him to speak to us anymore because he's, uh, he's got you know, higher order issues that he's taking care of. But the organization he's created has created a network of Jews and Palestinians who have lived within three miles of each other their whole lives and literally were blank to each other and created relationships of caring to the fear of some in the Israeli government and some in the PA because that's what they fear the most. Look, Hamas prosecuted people in Gaza who during the war reached across to the Israeli side to compare how things were going and to express concern for each other. That was a war crime as far as Hamas was concerned. Not necessarily the PA, but it is, it is scary for governments who have diplomatic policies and military policies to be threatened by a, an emerging reality on the ground which does not comport with their view of how things should be. Anybody else besides Jerry before we give him the microphone again? Yes, Rick. <laughs> I'm not trying to shut you down. I'm trying to be egalitarian. Very reformed, right? <laughs> so my wife Carol and I went with Rabbi Gibson, I believe it was 2017. To so I, real, I took you there. Yeah, for the second time. And it was very interesting because we went to a area where the very ultra-Orthodox rabbi was asked by his daughter, did you know that there are Arabs living within three miles of our big complex? And for the first time, he was honest with his daughter and told her about it. And then the woman who we met with, who, was this the sister of the person you're talking about? Yeah. 
she talked about losing her mother, losing her brother, all because the Israelis wouldn't allow them when they closed down a check, one of the security checkpoint areas, to go to a hospital. And she said, how many more of our family members have to die before we can talk to our neighbors? And it was so enlightening to see below the surface of the, po the politics, how these people decided they wanted to have peace in their lifetime or their grandkids' lifetimes. And when we went to this place, it was like a totally different view of Israel than Rabbi Gibson had ever talked about in synagogue because all of a sudden you were realizing when he said it is complex, it is so complex that people who are losing their brother, their mother, all of a sudden are willing to talk to the people who caused this to happen. So and, so, and vice versa, those who've been affected But it by was very, very, right. very enlightening. And I just want to add one thing. Carol and I happened to go on a trip to uh, Portugal in Spain to, shoot, to see um, with a organization the view of how Jews were treated throughout time in the Iberian Peninsula. And I only bring it up because when you go into Portugal, they act as if this is the safest, most um, open, inclusive society in the world. And in the end of our trip, we went down to an area where 5,000 Jews were massacred outside of a, a Catholic church because, in fact, they had been allegedly conversos. And what I'm saying, when you say this is complex, the people you believe are your friends today were unfortunately your holy enemies in the past, and now all of a sudden Jews are welcomed in Portugal. So go figure. You know, it's very complex. Todd, is there anybody who's texted you? No, there, there's not. But that's called a captive audience. Mark Beck is over here. Mark Beck, and then Sorry. Jerry, and then uh, as I leave here, I'm going to throw a suitcase in the car and go down to see my grandkids in D.C. Okay, just. And what a delight it is, and I hope that my thoughts have been challenging and not particularly offensive, but challenging nonetheless. Yes, Mark. So I, I was interested done? in your suggestion about taking a to listen to him. I'm get coffee or something like that. And I have a relatively new friend, and I like the idea, but I'm also hesitant because I want to be friends with this guy. And if we get my politics get in the way, I'm a little bit nervous that that's going to be the only thing we talk about. You know, <laughs> have to head lightly. Do you have any suggestions? Sure. Ask about principles. Mm -hmm. Instead of being inflamed by the political issue the way it's been framed by the other person, say, that's very interesting. What's the principle underneath this? Why? And by the way, if they won't tell you their principles, you can just smile and say, oh, I'm not going to invest anymore in this relationship. Mm -hmm. Refusal to talk about why you believe what you believe is is a direct message that this relationship isn't going to work. And the only reason that to continue it is because you like bashing your head against a wall, and I know you don't, right? Your head is too valuable. Jerry. So just three quick points. I wonder, Rabbi, would you be willing, with some of us contributing, to write an essay on TMI? An essay about Three Mile Islands that we're talking about these Three Mile Islands. And I think the world needs to hear, not TMI as too much, but you know, it's not enough. Secondly, on the vaccines, how about if people who don't take vaccines agree not to vaccinate their pets? And we just let rabies um, solve the problem. It's Darwinian. Um, and then lastly, we, I, I fear terrorists. Mm -hmm. And maybe those bastards like Menachem Begin and George Washington should be shunned rather than acclaimed because they were terrorists. Well, no, George Washington was an army lieutenant, then captain, colonel, and general who he, he rebelled. He was not a terrorist. Again, the question of one person's freedom fighter being another person's terrorist is a whole other branch of discussion. And Jerry, I'm going to say this with great love. It's 
the way it's raised is inflammatory, and I refuse to be inflamed. So, so what, what I'm saying is, if, if that's the point you want to talk about, let's talk about each thing in its context and see why those things happened. So, no, I just say I, in the context of when we lump them as terrorists, right. our terrorists We have often... Well... Because of our, because of our commitment to our narrative. So, listen, I, I have to tell you, having been to Israel 33 times, is the only reason that I have any credibility when I talk about Israel, talked about Israel from the pulpit. I would say fully half of American rabbis in North America, American rabbis, from the Department of Redundancy Department, I'm sorry, oh. American rabbis will not talk about Israel. Because they learned what I learned when I was a junior high school teacher, which is you never break up a fight from the middle because they can both hit you at the same time. You wait till one person's gonna throw a punch, you throw him into a locker. This makes a noise and calms everything down. Rabbis are getting attacked. Rabbis are having congregants leave. Rabbis are having their salaries threatened if they take forthright public stances. So I'm going to take in your suggestion. I will tell you that writing such an essay will make me and Temple Sinai and my family a target. So I prefer to speak in groups. I prefer to speak at coffees and lunches and dinners and on long walks and in classes. I'm presently teaching in St. Vincent and Latrobe. I teach 20 undergrads who have never been, never been in their lives. So I have a huge responsibility to frame issues in an equitable manner, in a way that doesn't just share what I believe is important, even though I have to share what I believe is important. I do not think the public discourse that goes on in social media will lead to either convincing other people or to long-term solutions, which is why I have never tweeted, ever. Bigger than you. Plan to you that, Mom, stop. Let me, just hold on. Uh, a question, and that is, uh, to what extent did the recent uh, relocation of the U.S. Embassy from uh, Tel Aviv to Jerusalem have on the prospects for peace, if any? Well, it's interesting, although I disagree with, pro with probably 85 to 90 percent. Well, I should put this on. I can hear it. it has to be plugged in the back. Mute. Somebody needs to mute up there. Okay. Um, there is no doubt that I have always considered Jerusalem the eternal capital of the state of Israel and of the Jewish people. And the fact that there is an embassy there is wonderful. What I wanted is I wanted a quid pro quo. I wanted if there was going to be an American embassy there, what was Israel going to give to the other side to help them with their local populations that were, and which were, had animus toward that idea. Now what has happened is the larger geopolitical issue, which is Iran versus Iraq, and if you say, well, where did Iran and Iraq start fighting? Excuse me, Persia and Babylon have been fighting for 4,000 years. This ain't new anybody, okay? So Iran's influence and its ability to use proxies like Hezbollah and Hamas and the Houthis and everything else is terrifying Saudi Arabia and the other Gulf states into an embrace with Israel for mutual economic and military protection. So, I, I think that the Abraham Accords, although you know, I disagreed with the whole public spectacle of that they were, it, it, under, it, it is overarching to a reality that most American Jews do not avail themselves of, which is that Israel is a player, not the player in the Middle East, and the Iran, Iraq, the Iran, by the way, Iraq is now basically a satellite of Iran. The Iran-Saudi Arabia, the Shia-Sunni split, is coming up to be a world-changing factor far more than the plight of the Palestinians, which is frankly why you don't hear that much more about the Palestinians except on campuses and in other places where their organization is dedicated to easing their plight or, or, or lobbying for their cause. I have hope in the long term. I am a short-term pessimist. I think things are terrible right now. I wonder if my children are going to have clean water. I'm a long-term optimist. I think in 8,000 years, we're gonna get this right. 
And without God sending a Messiah, I do think if we can hold on another couple thousand years, we'll have found ways to harness the sun or other things to make life pretty good for a lot of people. I don't know, though. I'm not a prophet. I got an A in, in prophets at school. I failed prophecy, I just want you to know. And I'm not a judge. So people used to come to me all the time saying, well, this person said this. I said, well, okay, they did. The only thing I know about the judge is that the judge ain't me. And judging myself was a full-time job and more. And it does not diminish you or the passion with which you hold your values and principles to show compassion to somebody who's being unreasonable. I guess they have a problem. I guess this issue is important to them. You do not have to be sucked down into the vortex of their passions. And I strongly encourage people not to do that for the welfare of you and for the welfare of the Jewish community that we love. I'm going to end there. Thank you very much for listening to me. I hope it was enlightening. And um, I think that a copy of my remarks will be available on the website if I clean up the grammar. Yes, and I think we're also going to have the video uh, portion of the program online as well. So. So again, so thank you very much, Rabbi Gibson. Thank you all for your questions and for your attendance this morning. So I wanted to say something. Believe me, I'm emeritus, but I'm still Temple Sinai, you know, bleeding every drop. Next week is a fantastic cantorial program, Friday and Saturday in three weeks. Dan Nichols, one of my favorite people on all of God's green earth, is going to be here. I get to sing with him. He's an incredible song leader. We do his melodies all the time here. He's going to be here for Friday night services, I think Shabbat morning services and the uh, Saturday sing-along, and Sunday, 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 as we used to say in Minnesota, Sunday, Sunday, Sunday is the completion of the Torah. And whereas Barbara and I wrote with the Soferet's hand upstairs, the first word of the Torah, Bereshit, we're going to write the word Yisrael, which is the last word of the Torah, oh, three weeks from today. And thank you for, again, honoring the memory of my father, because it's very hard for me to believe that he's gone, much less that it's been five years. Anyway, thank you. Much love. Thank you, Rabbi, for sharing your thoughts with us, and safe travels to you and Barbara uh, this afternoon down to Washington. And uh, again, thank you all for being here. Our next uh, Brunchless Lecture Series uh, program is going to be on Sunday, November 21st, when our immediate past president, Saul Straussman, is going to speak on a favorite subject of his, which is the disappearance of black teenagers from pop culture in the 1950s. So look for the publicity on that particular program. So enjoy the rest of your Sunday. And again, thank you for being here this morning. And thank you uh, on Zoom for uh, tuning in as well. Good day. <laughs>